More than once in our sailing career, we've gone so far down a refit rabbit hole that we almost forgot what it was like to sail over the horizon and to live the life of a sailor. Sailing the world and living in a boatyard, in a way, are the two most opposite experiences you can have. And yet, for many of us, they are inescapably connected. After six months of boat projects in Washington, North Carolina, we're finally on the move again and are easing back into the rhythm of life underway. But between saying an emotional farewell to our parents I think that oh, is going to be great. <laughs> yeah, right. last minute safety gear checks and mentally preparing ourselves for the crossing Ugh, but I feel so sick right now we've got just a few more boxes to check before we can cast the lines and sail off on our most challenging journey yet crossing the Atlantic Ocean So it is a windy day and we are gonna get the sails up and do a little bit of sailing. And this is gonna be our first time sailing with our new sails, with the Carolina Cradle, with the new furlers. So I'm excited, but also a lot of things that could go wrong. <laughs> I think we need to turn hard right <laughs> and we're going to be going like right into the wind. Yeah. So I think, yeah, we're not going to be able to sail much longer. <laughs> yeah. So we got the Genoa furled in and Jordan dropped the main. So we are back to just motoring straight into these waves. Well, it has calmed down a lot, which is really nice because the motion is a lot more pleasant and we're getting ready to tuck into the ICW again, so it's going to be even more calm. The fuel is clean, the engine is strong, the sails are strong, the crew is really strong, and we are almost in Beaufort. And what are we going to do when we get to Beaufort? We're going to get ice cream. Ice cream. What do you think, bud? ICW is a little bit kooky. It's beautiful, so I'm tempted to just look all around me, but then the navigation charts are like, sunken filing here, obstruction here, and then I'm kind of like weaving like a crazy woman through this really shallow area. It's a little bit stressful, but really pretty. Bud Dolphin, uh, starboard side. I'm really glad we had the opportunity to bring the boat from Washington to Beaufort because it was actually a really great little shakedown cruise. I'm feeling pretty good about crossing that big pond. The old pond. The old pond. And cross the old pond. The old Just pond. zip the roo yeah. right across. We made it! Land ho, baby! Just us and the overpass. What are you thinking of the pizza, bud? 
It was good. I totally meant to film the pizza. <laughs> and I just was so hungry, I started eating. And then I realized that I ate it all. Then you blacked out. <laughs> yeah. a very good pizza. It's good. <laughs> Although Oso's going a little nuts because that ice cream we gave him. I think he's on his like first sugar rush of his life. Well, he had the sugar jitters a while ago, but I think he's experiencing a sugar crash right now. Oh, he's yeah. just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Walking around Beaufort felt like walking around a smaller, more laid back version of Key West. It was charming, but in an unpretentious way. And although it's a small coastal Southern town, we met people from all over the country and from all walks of life. Its history is deeply rooted in the sea. And though Beaufort has the safest and most navigable harbor in all of North Carolina, it never really developed into a fully fledged port town, mostly due to its isolation from the interior. But because of its proximity to the infamous Cape Hatteras, sometimes referred to as the graveyard of the Atlantic, Beaufort has offered sailors of every era a harbor of refuge when the sea is too violent to round the Cape. So although Beaufort is now mostly a tourist town, it holds on to its heritage as a major crossroads for sailors from all over the world. Well, Steve, our crew member, is coming today in about an hour, which means we need to transform the quarter berth from a tool shed into a bedroom. Yeah, this is a day I've been dreading for a while, because if you look in here in the quarter berth, it's <laughs> once again gotten super, super messy. Well, that came on quickly. <laughs> I was like, I need to make some food so that I'm not nauseous. And then I took a couple bites and I was like, oh, it's coming up. I guess I will wait on breakfast. Yeah. Oh, this is gonna be a fun passage. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we got some stuff. All right. Come on board, Steve. There's stuff everywhere, which... And I'm bringing in even more stuff. Yeah. yeah. So Steve is gonna be our third person on the boat for the trip to Bermuda, and he's coming with us from Bermuda to the Azores. So we're gonna have, we're gonna have Steve for a while. What's your sailing experience, Steve? I feel like we're very like physically close to each other right now. And now we're even closer. Yeah, we, we're gonna Strap be in. close to each other for a long time. I have been sailing for about 30 years. Um, oh, yeah. And then I started sailing with my old man on like a 17 foot siren. And then we started racing and we were racing competitively for about 20 years and change. Yeah, you may remember that episode where we almost won and then we kind of did win, which is a thing in and of itself. So I'm um, coming along all the way. Nice. Sweet. And I hear you don't get seasick. Yeah, cool. Now that's on camera. Yeah. I, I, I never <laughs> have before, but we're going to find out if that holds true. Yeah. <laughs> freezer stuff. Hey, Dow, where do you go? You want to go in the freezer too? Welcome aboard. Yay. Woo. Woo. <laughs> Welcome to your home for the next, what, four weeks? Absolutely. Let's do this. Yeah. All right, we are at Bonehedge, which is the whale center in Beaufort, and we're gonna be meeting with the chief scientist here, Keith, who's gonna tell us all about his research with whaling. And we're gonna see some really cool artifacts and skeletons and learn as much as we can about whaling. There's also right now the Beaufort Music Festival going on, so we're gonna be jamming out a little bit in the peripheral to the craziness that's happening back there. Nothing says jamming out, rocking out like whale bones. So we are in Beaufort, North Carolina at the Bonehenge Whale Center, a facility that was built and is run and operated by a charitable nonprofit. We respond to reports of dead, dying, or entangled cetaceans, which is a taxonomic term that refers to whales, dolphins, and porpoises. We prepare skeletal material for study. Just about everything you see in here is from a stranded North Carolina specimen. You're standing right now under the lower jaws of a North Atlantic right whale. This poster represents all the species of cetacean known to science on Earth as of 12 years ago when it was created. Carrie put an orange dolphin next to the names of all the species that we have documented in North Carolina, and there are 34 of them. That's more than any other state. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Oh my gosh. Can I touch some of the teeth? Not only can you touch them, two of them I didn't glue in. Oh, what? So I want to invite 
You can play it too. I'm not sure Steve, who you are, but you can play it. Go glue, glue it in, dude. Steve's actually our resident whale specialist. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> you have to find the fake tooth, the plastic tooth in this jaw. This is exciting. A plus star. Yay. Yes. Okay. Very good. So, this is the original. But before I destroyed this uh -huh. by cutting it in half, uh -huh. I hot glued it into a plastic cup and I made that tooth with this mold because I wanted to cut the tooth and count the lines to estimate the age of this whale. Oh, interesting. It is, it's like rings in a tree. We believe each line corresponds to a year of growth mm -hmm. and it enabled me to estimate that this that's whale old. was 23 years old. Yeah, cool. And that's a beautiful replica of that tooth that even shows the gum line and yeah. happy birthday, you can keep that. Really? Yes. Oh, thank you. How and cool. And here's a little, information about the whale oh and the tooth and sperm whales in North Carolina. Oh, Just a thank you. souvenir from Bonehenge. That's nice. So awesome. <laughs> you gonna make a necklace out of it, Ben? Yeah, I'll wait yeah, around my could, neck. Yeah. Don't mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are at the Beaufort Maritime Museum with Christine, who is gonna be our guide for today, and she's gonna tell us all about the cool, um, I just got distracted by that big goose. <laughs> Look out. She's gonna tell us all about the cool parts of this museum. <laughs> Sorry. She's here every week, but every week it seems like a new place for her, which That's is pretty great. exciting. <laughs> North Carolina is known as Graveyard of the Atlantic because we've had just the sheer amount of ships that have wrecked off of the coast. And the United States Life Saving Service was developed to respond to those ships that had wrecked. And this is one of the tools that they would have had. It's a life car and they would have actually shuttled this life car between the wrecked ship and the shore hmm. um, to help save the people off of that ship. This is rated to hold about 11 people <gasps> at a time. What? Yeah, if you take a look around, you can see inside the hatch and get a feel for how crowded it would have been. This exhibit is called Golden Pirates of the Silver Screen. Um, we put this up to help explain how pirates kind of evolved from being the terrorists of the 1700s to the children's Halloween costume today. And movies had a large part to do with that. And what's interesting is the early pirate movies portrayed pirates still as the bad guys. Um, and then we see them start to evolve later on into those romantic heroes. But that starts somewhere around like Douglas Fairbanks. And that's in the 1920s. So that's still fairly early. We see them becoming a romantic anti-hero. When was Treasure Island written? It was first published in 1883, and it's one of the most remade. There's hundreds of versions of Treasure Island. Yeah. Like um, Muppet got Treasure Island. Muppet right? Treasure Island. <laughs> when we think about a pirate's image, when we think about what they said, like art, Mm. It doesn't come from 1718, it comes from Treasure Island. And it comes from the movie because this actor had a heavy Scottish accent, so when he interpreted and portrayed Long John Silver, he portrayed him with a growl. Huh. And then ever since that, other actors picked it up and started imitating him. A lot of the imagery as far as clothing also comes from that. The idea of walking the plank or X marks the spot, that comes from the book itself. Yeah, oh, that's mm. fascinating. Okay, so we are off to dinner and we have got our family. So we've got Steve's parents. parents, we've got my yeah, folks, Co is here. We're Good gonna have people. like a You're celebratory there. dinner. Yeah. They're you. just gonna wish us bon voyage, right Steve? Yes. Bon voyage. All right, my dad's even got a sailing hat on. Oh, nice. right. What do you think of the trip, Mom? Do you think we should be nervous? Are you nervous? Yes, I am nervous. You're nervous? But that's okay. You've got to do what you want to do. Life's too short. What do you think, Sue? Are you, are you nervous, excited for us? Yes, both. Yeah, it's both. So what do you think, Sio? <laughs> Steve, what do you think? Sio, <laughs> come on. I think that Sio's going to be great. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what, did you, what did you ask me? <laughs> what do you think about our upcoming trip? Nervous. Yeah. And nervous and nervous. You just got to remember, Steve's going to be there. Nothing yeah. bad can happen. I know. I know. That's why I had to talk to him. He's going to be beside him. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nervous, she lives excited, she lives jealous, about 20 minutes and, and I can only wish you uh, fair winds and calm seas, not too calm, and uh, please take care of yourselves and each other. Right. Go right. well, Leo. Everything Leo just said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Succinct to the point. It's great. Yeah. That's the speech of the night. <laughs> okay. All right. 
one trip or death. Okay, got got your hand? Yeah, a little bit. You don't want that, do you? I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> kind of need that. Come thank, on. You. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. It's been such a long time since I've provisioned for a long passage, and I've never done it on Atticus too. So figuring out what to buy and where to put it all took a fair amount of time and effort, and I'm still a long way away from coming up with an ideal solution, but I've got lots of time to practice. So we have talked about in the past that we were not gonna have a water maker for this voyage. And the main reason being that we just didn't have the time to install one. And then it dawned on us that there are portable water makers out there that would take zero time to install. So we decided to purchase a Rain Man water maker that we can store right here in the cockpit locker. We can bring those units out whenever we're ready to fill up on water, set the whole thing up, and be ready to rock and roll in like a minute or two. This is an AC unit, it runs on like normal 110 power, so we're gonna be running it through our inverter. In the future, I would like to do a permanent installation, but it's actually super amazing that this can just be stored in a cockpit locker. Like that's, I think that's just the coolest thing. Basically, we've got our green discharge hose, so I'm just gonna put this in a scupper to let the discharge water flow out. And we've got our white product water hose, so this is where like the good water is gonna come out of. This right here is a flow meter, so I'm able to see how much product water is being produced, how many gallons per hour. The last thing that we need to do is we actually turn on the deck wash pump. So that pump is going to feed water through that deck wash fitting on deck to the unit, and then the unit's gonna create high pressure going through these membranes. Then I double check that the pressure valve is totally open. Turn the unit on. Then I just let it run like this until there's no air bubbles coming out of the discharge hose. And then I basically just close this pressure valve until the dial goes all the way up to this dark green kind of sweet spot area. And then basically, we're able to test this water to make sure that it's good water. And so we're at 200 parts per million, which is acceptable. Yeah, there you go. That's drinking water. So then we basically just run this product water hose straight to our tank fills on deck and just fill our tanks the normal way. I can see that we're actually producing 35 gallons per hour, which is huge. I mean, with three crew members, we anticipate using about nine to 10 gallons a day, and that's being pretty comfortable, like taking showers and stuff. And so in all reality, we probably only need to run this thing about an hour every three days or so. So, I mean, I'm super happy with this setup. All right, so I finally got all of our stuff that we need to throw into our ditch kit so that if we have to abandon ship, we're gonna have everything that we need to survive out there until we're rescued. So I'm not gonna go over everything that we've got in our ditch kit, but if you wanna take a look at our inventory, you can look at it right here. So one of the coolest items that we've got is a solar still, and this is really nifty because it makes fresh water out of ocean water by using the sun and a process of condensation. We've also got a couple extra packs of drinking water and then emergency rations. Second part of our ditch kit is the most exciting part. It's all of our electronics, including our solar panels, which we're gonna be able to use to... Ugh, but I feel so sick right now. You want me to take over? Can you? Yeah, yeah I can. How have you been feeling lately? You, you've been doing better, I feel like. Been doing better. But then I've also been throwing up more. And I've just been getting hit with these waves of just like feeling awful. Yeah. So. Okay. I'll take over. <laughs> Don't cry. So I'll take over here, but I mean, Desiree really deserves all the credit for putting this together. She's been like doing a ton of research. I've been laughing because we didn't have any of this stuff on Atticus 1. So now I feel like we're never going to die. We will live forever with safety gear. So first of all, a lot of the cool gear that we got is from a company called ACR. And they just specialize in a lot of awesome safety gear, a lot of stuff that's really got a great application on offshore sailboats. So first off, we've got our e -perb. This bad boy is really easy to activate. It floats and it'll last like 48 hours, I believe. It lasts a long time. And it basically sends an emergency signal to a search and rescue base somewhere in the search and rescue ether. And it'll say like, these people need to be rescued right now. We also have a PLB, a personal locator beacon. This is basically like a mini e like a smaller version. We wanna have another EPIRB 
in our ditch kit because a lot of the time if a single EPIRB goes off, that could happen by accident and it happens all the time. So if you're able to activate two EPIRBs from the same location in the same time frame, then it's probably not an accident and they're gonna be more likely to like send rescuers right away. We also have the ACR bivy stick, which I spit on right now. So this is a badass thing. This is basically like a satellite communication device that works with your phone. So you're able to like send text messages by just connecting to this thing. It also has an SOS button that will send like an emergency signal to a predefined search and rescue network. You can also pre-program a message to like your friends and family. Like you can push it and it says like, everything's okay. We've actually programmed ours to let our friends and family know we are not okay. Like we have abandoned the boat. <laughs> We've got an electronic distress flare, which is badass. It's basically back in the day, you had to have like a flare that would like burn and it was just kind of messy and it might pop your life raft, it might burn you. Nowadays you can have just an electronic flare that just flashes a really bright light. And in a lot of ways like survival now in the modern sailing era is a lot different than it was like 20 or 30 years ago. I mean back in the day the life raft and ditch kit was sort of designed so that you might be in it for like a month or two, like long periods of time. Nowadays with all of these communication devices, the odds that you're gonna be in a life raft for a long period of time are very, very small, but you've got to keep these things functioning. And so ACR makes this folding solar panel, which is super awesome. And it's just got a USB port here, so we're able to charge our bivy stick, we're able to charge our phone, and basically stay in direct communication with our family at home, with rescuers. We've also kind of trained our family on like what phone numbers to call, how to coordinate a rescue. We also have a submersible VHF radio. So this thing can get super wet, and then we can talk to boats and whatnot. If you you guys have seen that movie all is lost like if that dude had like any one of these things he would have been fine yeah the next thing we need is like a cattle prong like an electric cattle probe or whatever to like sh shock the sharks that is why acr makes this cattle prod no just kidding so one other thing we didn't mention is this really cool bag from ACR, and this thing actually floats, which is awesome. Because you could imagine if you're trying to abandon ship and step onto a life raft, there's a fairly decent chance you're gonna drop your stuff. I'd like to say that we planned how well this fit, but we did not. <laughs> but yeah, so this is perfect because the very first thing that you can grab is the life raft and it's like, comes out nice and easy. Even if we're sinking so fast, we can at least get the life raft out. Oh yes, I can feel the safety beneath me. All right, good morning. So I think it looks like tomorrow we've got a really good weather window to start heading for Bermuda. So basically you can see first thing tomorrow morning when we leave, it's really light and we are gonna have to motor for about half a day, but then the wind really fills in and we're gonna be on a beam reach, which is just gonna be beautiful. And then it fills in even more to like 16, 17 knots right on the beam. And we can speed things up and see that this kind of continues until the wind picks up into like the high teens, low twenties, but that's just for a little while. And then it gets right back down into the teens. I mean, this is all super awesome sailing. And then right there towards the end, when we get to Bermuda, like that half day, before we get there, we're gonna have to motor again. So looks like the trip's gonna have a little bit of, you know, motoring on the bookends. It's gonna take us about five days to get to Bermuda. So, you know, the tail end of this forecast is a little iffy, like five days is kind of the maximum for a reliable or even semi-reliable forecast. But the really good news is that all four of these forecast models pretty much agree with what we should do for the first half of the trip. Also, if you are a patron, which first of all, thank you so much for supporting our videos. It means the world to us. We have a predict wind tracking link. So you can basically check out where we are, like what our speed is, where we're going, as well as like the winds that we're experiencing at that moment. And if you look over here, you can see we've got a test post here and we posted a photo. We're actually going to be posting text updates here on the side. You'll be able to see like where we were when we posted them. 
And so it'll just be a really cool way to kind of like play along from home and see how the passage is going in real time. And so if you've been considering becoming a patron, now would be a really great time to. We would really appreciate it. And you'd be able to follow along with us moment by moment as we cross the Atlantic, which is pretty cool. So now all we've got left to do is to head over to the fuel dock and fill up on fuel, fill up on water, and then uh, just kind of get ready to head out first thing tomorrow morning. Town Creek Marina, Town Creek Marina, this is Atticus. Oso is obsessed with me filling the water tanks. He just sits there the whole time and waits for the water to overflow and then he tries to catch the water. <laughs> it's really funny. He's like, oh my god, there's water! It's amazing! <laughs> Alright, so we're all fueled up. We got water and now we're just gonna head out to an anchorage for the evening. There we're gonna go. take a page out of John Kretschmer slash Lynn and Larry Party's book and uh, just go out to anchor for the night so we can kind of relax a little bit, try and get into passage mode. And then in the morning, all we gotta do is pick up the anchor and go. I know it's kind of cliche, but I always get a little bit emotional when we cast the lines before a big trip. And although I know we're not going far tonight, I know that this is the last time I'll step foot on land for a while. Does that look good? That's so much easier with two people, oh my god. Yeah. All right, what do you think, baby, huh? We are out on the mooring ball. I know. Are you ready to go to Bermuda? Yeah? What about the Bahamas? We get there fast and then we take it slow. That's where we We did it, guys. We made it off the dock. Step one complete. Like the cutting off of the engine. It's like an audible signal of just yeah. coming down a little bit. Yeah. How about the audible signal of oh, so freaking out? <laughs> yeah. He's like, guys, let's go back. Come on. There's still time. What do you think, buddy? You know, I'm in a position where I trust you and Steve so much that I don't I don't feel nervous because I've seen all the work we put in the boat. I think it's just a series of like problems and solutions that are gonna arise and I think we're all up for the challenge. Yeah, I think that's the thing that gets me the most excited when I think about ocean crossings and like long offshore trips is right now we're still in the world of like, there is a system in place to, to help you. And like starting tomorrow, it's just us and the boat, you know? And so I think it's pretty neat that like, to put yourself in a situation that's you're almost never in where it's like okay now it's down to you four to like make this work i'm grateful for the opportunity to do this because i'm like wildly thankful for one the friendship that we three have built that allows us to do this thing for five six weeks i'm wildly touched by that it's been an yeah. absolute pleasure well we're so happy cheers to man you and that and that it worked out and i think we're gonna have a sweet little crew. What's Oso's position on the boat? Morale booster. I was gonna say chief morale Chief officer. morale officer. <laughs> CMO. <maybe. laughs> CMO. <laughs> chief morale officer on deck. Chief morale officer's taking a shit on deck. <laughs> <laughs>